Usually, when it comes to love, weddings, and children, people imagine something sweet and pleasant. Such events evoke feelings of euphoria and joy, but by no means fear. And definitely, no one would think that something so horrific could happen. Gladys Ricard, a young woman from the small town of Tamboril in the Dominican Republic, was single-handedly raising her young son in 1979. At the age of 20, she had already experienced an unsuccessful romance while still in school, which left her with a child in her arms. Gladys' sister, Norma, was already living in the United States, and Gladys cherished the dream of joining her one day. To fulfill her aspiration, Gladys worked tirelessly, saving every penny she earned. She lived very modestly, denying herself everything and devoting all her time to work. And finally, her efforts paid off. She was able to move to the USA and settle with her sister's family in Manhattan, in the heart of New York. Unfortunately, at the beginning of her stay in America, Gladys did not have enough money to take her son with her, so little Davis stayed with relatives in his homeland. Immediately after moving, the woman began to learn English and got a job, working tirelessly to save money and bring her child to the States. And so, in 1983, her dream came true. She reunited with her four-year-old son. Realizing that her prospects were limited without an education, Gladys enrolled in college. She sought to increase her chances of getting a good job and start building a career. After completing her studies at the Faculty of Economics, the woman began to work in the field of accounting. Thanks to her abilities and diligence, she quickly became a high-class specialist and one of the most valuable employees of the firm. Step by step, Gladys climbed the career ladder, starting from the very bottom, and eventually reached the position of chief accountant in a large travel agency in the center of Manhattan. She was not at all like a typical immigrant. Gladys had mastered English perfectly, received an education, achieved success in a good job, and was saving money for her own home. In fact, she had brought her American dream to life. The only thing left was to find love and create a complete family. But in this matter, Gladys was very careful. It might have seemed that she was more focused on her career than on relationships and marriage. However, this was only a deceptive first impression. In fact, she dreamed of meeting her soulmate. In 1992, 10 years had already passed since Gladys moved to the USA. Every day she traveled the same route, in the morning by subway to the office, and in the evening back home, where she lived with her sister. It was on the subway that she met Augustin Garcia, one of the leaders of the Dominican community in the state, a prominent figure who had managed to build a successful career by the age of 40. Like our heroine, he had moved to the USA from the Dominican Republic at one time. This happened when he was still young. Just like Gladys, the man had come a long way, rising from poverty to successful entrepreneurship. At the time of their acquaintance, Augustin owned several small firms and was the father of two children from a previous marriage. Both lived with him in a large house. But it was not this that brought Augustin fame. In the local Dominican community, he held a prominent place as an ever-helpful person, always ready to come to the aid of his neighbor. Knowing from his own experience how difficult it is to immigrate and start life from scratch, he sincerely sought to help all those who dared to try their hand at this thorny path. Augustin became the director of the Dominican Chamber of Commerce in New York and several other organizations related to his native country. At the same time, he not only held positions, but also led active social activities. Thanks to his efforts, several kindergartens and schools were opened. He became a respected and influential member of the community. This man seemed like an ideal match for Gladys, an equally purposeful and sensitive young woman. One of the most attractive traits of Augustin, in Gladys's opinion, was his compliant nature. He behaved like a true gentleman, polite, sociable, so he immediately attracted the attention of our heroine. In fact, their meeting was a pure coincidence, because Augustine almost never used the subway. That day he found himself there by a combination of circumstances. His car broke down. The wealthy businessman was immediately enchanted by the beauty Gladys, and he decided to get to know her. They talked for the rest of the ride, 
and then exchange phone numbers to meet again soon. This is how their romance began. Augustin constantly invited his beloved to restaurants, treated her to exquisite dishes, and gave her expensive gifts. Gladys's family rejoiced for her when they learned about her new boyfriend. This man was a worthy candidate for the role of husband and father to her son. The couple dated for over a year before Augustin decided he was ready to take their relationship to the next level. He offered Gladys to move in with him. The young mother gladly accepted this long-awaited proposal. Confessing to her relatives and loved ones, Gladys dreamed more than anything of a wedding during this period. She cherished the hope that Augustine would propose to her and they would be able to raise three children together. In addition, the woman aspired to give birth to their own babies. By the time Gladys turned 33, she finally moved in with her beloved. But from the very beginning of their life together, the situation began to deteriorate. Davis, Gladys's son, found it very difficult to get along with Augustine's children. The boy made considerable efforts, especially at the request of his mother, who literally begged him to seek common ground with everyone in every possible way. But the man's children were too arrogant and often provoked Gladys's son into conflicts. Unfortunately, it was not possible to establish a relationship the atmosphere only intensified. At the same time, Augustine invariably took the side of his children, even if they were clearly in the wrong. This caused significant tension in the couple. After two years of such a life and endless arguments, Gladys realized that she no longer wanted to torment her son and told her man about the impossibility of their living together. Augustine agreed with her, but did not break off the relationship. He helped the woman find new housing, which was located nine minutes away from his house. It was a spacious two-story house for which the man spared no money for his beloved. It seemed that in this way, it was possible to smooth out the sharp edges in their relationship. The couple continued to see each other when Augustine visited Gladys. At that time, Gladys's circle had become so used to her chosen one that they considered him almost a member of the family. The wealthy businessman everywhere introduced his companion as his wife, despite the fact that they were not officially married. Gladys did not stop trying to persuade the man to have a wedding, but he flatly refused, citing his previous unsuccessful marriage. Augustine insisted that he no longer wanted to officially marry and have children together, so he saw no point in unnecessary bureaucratic hassles. According to Gladys's loved ones, over time, the situation reached a critical point when Gladys's happiness in this relationship began to fade. After a few years of romance, the man's unpleasant character traits became apparent. It turned out that he periodically had affairs on the side and also began to demonstrate increasingly controlling behavior. The situation escalated. Gladys was aware of all this, but remained silent for a long time, not wanting problems. Unfortunately, her inaction only exacerbated the problems in the relationship. During another argument, Augustine pulled out his gun and chased the woman. She managed to hide in the bathroom and lock the door. But from that moment, Gladys realized that it was time to break ties with her boyfriend. However, fear of the manipulator still did not allow her to leave for some time. She was looking for a convincing reason so that Augustine would not have any arguments. The easiest way was to catch the cheater in his affairs on the side. The situation escalated until the fall of 1998, when Gladys finally visited Augustine's office and caught him with another woman. This was an excellent opportunity to end the relationship. She immediately told the man that it was over, moved out of his house, and also notified all her relatives about it so that everyone knew that the wealthy businessman was no longer a welcome guest in Gladys's home. Despite the breakup, Augustine was not ready for such changes. He perceived Gladys as his property, which he had owned for seven years. After this quarrel, he constantly called her, left gifts on the doorstep, bouquets of flowers, and even a Bible. Our heroine considered these to be pathetic attempts to win her back, but the family saw something more in this. It seemed that the man was making symbolic gifts with a hidden meaning. In any case, the woman was not going to renew her relationship with him under any circumstances. Several months passed, 
and during her lunch break at a restaurant, Gladys met James Preston Jr. The new acquaintance also worked in the field of accounting and worked part-time as a musician. From the first glance, there was a mutual attraction between them. After just a few dates, the couple decided to formalize their relationship officially. For two months, James and Gladys spent all their free time together. Finally, a wedding date was set, September 26, 1999. Our heroine and her family were happy because the woman's long-standing dream of a wedding in a white dress was about to come true. Gladys was engrossed in pleasant hassles of wedding preparations, so much so that she did not even realize how almost every night Augustine would come to her house and watch her for hours. He clearly still had not been able to overcome his proprietary feelings. On August 12th, a month and a half before the wedding, Gladys and her fiancé were enjoying a quiet, romantic evening at the bride's house. Suddenly, Augustine appeared at the doorstep. At first, he calmly asked to talk to his ex, but she refused. Then the man lost his temper, started shouting, and then threw stones at the windows. Fearing further aggression, Gladys called the police. Augustine was detained, but she decided not to press charges so that her ex would not have problems. Moreover, she herself did not want to be distracted from preparing for the celebration, which turned out to be a huge mistake. On September 24th, just two days before the wedding, Gladys went to the store to buy everything necessary for the bridesmaids. As it turned out, all this time she was being followed by her ex. The man ambushed her in one of the supermarket departments and hugged her as if they were on good terms and were even a couple. Gladys did not resist so as not to provoke the stalker's anger. They just exchanged a couple of words and then said goodbye. That same evening, she talked with her future husband and family. The woman complained about Augustine's behavior, which caused her concern and became too intrusive. Unfortunately, she did not even realize how dangerous he was. And then came the long-awaited day, September 26, 1999. 39-year-old Gladys was at home with her family and friends. The woman was preparing for the ceremony. She got dressed, did her hair, and makeup. The bride was beaming with happiness, which was captured in photos and videos. These turned out to be the last moments of her life. At this time, the groom was already waiting for her in the church, but circumstances developed in such a way that this happy moment was overshadowed by blood. Without any warning, the bride's ex-boyfriend stalker entered the doors of the living room where Gladys was. The man abruptly took a 38 caliber pistol out of his bag and shot the bride three times. The first bullet hit her in the shoulder, the second in the spine, and the third in the head. After the third shot, the victim died instantly. The paramedics who arrived later were powerless. The woman's dream of a wedding remained unfulfilled. The shooter was immediately detained and taken to the police station. He did not try to escape and did not resist during the arrest. Here, Augustine talked to one of the investigators. The killer confessed that he was heading to his house in Manhattan and decided to drive his car past his ex's house. He did this constantly. From these words, it seemed that such behavior was real stalking. But Augustine did not see anything special in these trips, explaining it by his sentimentality. That morning, September 26th, he was stunned by the large number of people in dresses and tuxedos, as well as several limousines in front of his ex's house. He had no idea that Gladys was getting married. The man was so surprised that he drove up and down the street several times before stopping opposite. Augustine still did not understand whose wedding it was and decided to go inside to find out what exactly was happening. As soon as the man got out of his car on the opposite side of the street, the victim's brother, a young man named Juan, approached him. He was cautious, knowing about the ex's bad temper. The relative tried to convince him to leave so as not to ruin Gladys's wedding. Then Augustine realized that his ex was marrying someone else, but did not show it. The man wriggled out. According to Augustine, he was invited to the celebration, so the brother did not interfere, and he calmly entered the house. No one argued with him. When the criminal was first asked to describe the shooting in the house, the killer claimed that he did not remember anything. 
But after some time, Augustine confessed to detectives that he always carried a weapon with him, and on that day, he brought it into the house. When asked why he dealt with an innocent woman, he refused to answer. The very next day, the detainee was brought to the courthouse for a preliminary hearing. It was supposed to read out the list of charges against him. Here he had a chance to plead guilty, avoid an exhausting trial, and achieve a mitigation of the sentence. But he did not do it. It was decided to keep the defendant in custody with a bail of $5 million, which indicated the great threat that the criminal poses to society. The image of a kind and influential person instantly collapsed. This attack became a high-profile crime. As a result of the active work of the media, the story gained wide publicity. Journalists vied with each other to publish loud statements, rumors, and the most absurd assumptions. The killer's photograph began to appear regularly in the national news. The scale of this case attracted lawyers, including first-class specialists, who simply wanted to make a name and career for themselves in a high-profile murder case. The trial of the businessman was scheduled for October 2, 2001. Thus, the defense had almost two years to thoroughly prepare for the case and form a positive image of the criminal. Hired lawyers immediately began working with the media, holding press conferences, and speaking to the public. All this was required in order to form a certain opinion of people regarding the crime committed. Namely, the lawyers tried to portray Augustin as a victim. The first attempt they made was to accuse Gladys's brother, Juan, and the victim's son of attacking the uninvited guest. They argued that the shooter did not actually intend to kill his ex. It happened by accident when he began to defend his life from the aggressive Juan and Davis, who attacked him together. At the same time, the defenders began to tarnish the image of the victim, portraying the murdered bride as unfaithful, accusing her of numerous betrayals. They say Gladys and Augustine were going to resume their relationship, but behind his back, the woman was preparing to marry another. That is why the killer pulled the trigger, because of the emotional breakdown that occurred. Augustine was shocked to see his beloved woman getting married, of course, not to him. Although only the day before, they were walking through the supermarket holding hands, and at that moment, Juan attacked him, which provoked shots from the pistol. According to the defenders, it was a crime in the heat of passion, which, according to the laws of the state, was considered manslaughter. In this case, the accused faced a much milder punishment. For Augustine, it was five to ten years in prison instead of life imprisonment. A significant role in the recognition of this position by the public was played by the man's bright image. In fact, the accused was known as a caring and compassionate person who put all his heart and soul into the Latin American community of New York. As soon as false rumors spread that Gladys was cheating on Augustine, attitudes toward her immediately deteriorated. There were even people who believed that the victim got what she deserved. All this came as a real shock to the Ricard family. After Gladys's loved ones realized the colossal damage the killer's lawyers were doing, they began to attend every press conference trying to defend the good name of the murdered bride. The victim's brothers and sisters, as well as her parents, insisted that the rumors of infidelity were a dirty lie. They claimed that the relationship between the killer and his victim had long been severed and was no longer restored. It was Augustine who continued his obsessive stalking of the woman. He behaved inadequately, but only because of Gladys's compassion, he did not have problems with the law before the murder. Unfortunately, he himself was incapable of compassion. Information about the activities of the killer's defenders reached the judge. Attending press conferences and interviews with journalists were officially banned. However, they had already managed to cause colossal damage to the victim's image. This became a problem for the prosecution even during the trial. In court, the lawyers continued to portray the criminal as a victim tarnishing the murdered bride's name in every possible way. Gladys's family insisted that the attack was intentional. They even had one important trump card. It turned out that the attack process, as well as the bride's death, were recorded on tape. The beginning of the celebration and the preparation were filmed on camera.
Augustine did not notice it. When the first stage of the hearings was scheduled, only the judge had the right to view this video recording. The defenders continued to insist that this material should not be shown to the jury. They called it all an unfair advantage for the prosecution. The lawyers twisted as much as they could to prevent this most important argument of the prosecution. After lengthy discussions, the court decided that the evidence could be used, but only the moment where the shooting of the bride was directly captured. It was a 15-second fragment, and the prosecution doubted that it would be enough to convince the jury. Given that this moment of the recording could be taken out of context, it gave the lawyers room for maneuver. The defenders continued to build their tactics, arguing that the sudden attack of the victim's brother and son forced Augustine to take up arms, and the three bullets that hit Gladys were fired by accident. Despite the protests of the victim's family, the killer's lawyers insisted that all this was caused by her promiscuous lifestyle. Several witnesses were provided by the defense, in particular, the family that lived next door to Augustine. A father and his daughter testified in court, claiming that they had seen Gladys at the killer's house just a few days before the incident. They even believed that the lovers were still a couple and living together. Although, in fact, the woman had come to him to pick up her things that had remained. Thanks to these manipulations, the lawyers managed to gain the sympathy of the jury for the criminal. Fortunately, the prosecution had something to answer with. Of course, the tactic was mainly based on the video recording. These were sad shots in which the criminal took the life of his ex in front of her family members, including her son. Obviously, he was not defending himself because all the bullets fired hit the victim. After this demonstration of what happened, the prosecution began to point out other obvious flaws in the lawyer's version. In particular, the 15-second recording showed no evidence that the killer was attacked after entering Gladys's house. No one even approached him. Despite this, Augustine pulled out a weapon and opened fire. Moreover, he did not try to defend himself, since the barrel of the loaded pistol was aimed at the bride from the beginning to the last second. The attack was clearly a deliberate act of revenge on the grounds of jealousy, because the criminal came to the house with a weapon ready to kill. Not only was the pistol full of bullets, but he also took spare ones with him, apparently in case a full drum was not enough for the execution. Well, the lawyers had their own answers to this. Augustine was a well-known businessman, a wealthy person who could have his own enemies, so he always carried a loaded weapon with him in case of self-defense. The prosecution also tried to refute the lies of the lawyers, who portrayed the victim as promiscuous. There was ample evidence that after the breakup, the ex-boyfriend had stalked the woman for a long time. All her relatives stated this. The victim's own son was wary of Augustine, knowing how cruel this person was. His kindness and selflessness were just a mask that hid the real face of the criminal. Augustine's surveillance and unpredictable visits lasted at least the last few months. A list of license plate numbers of cars parked near Gladys's house was found in the offender's car. He was not just stalking his future victim, but conducting a real census of every person who was constantly in her area. Probably in this way, he wanted to separate the neighbor's cars and calculate the car of Gladys's future husband. While the debates were ongoing, the killer unexpectedly made a controversial decision. He decided to speak on his own behalf in front of the jury. This is what influenced the subsequent verdict. It is worth noting that in the practice of lawyers, such an act can be either a complete failure or a salvation for the accused. On October 16th, Augustine spoke in his own defense. The prosecution asked him to talk about the incident in the house. It was expected that he would exactly repeat the version of the lawyers, according to which he fell into a state of passion and lost control of himself. Instead, the criminal claimed that he felt calm when he saw his ex in a wedding dress. According to Augustine, Juan and Davis attacked him, but this argument had long been refuted after watching the video. At the same time, according to the defendant, he really fell out of reality at that moment and did not remember exactly how he fired the pistol. Fortunately for the prosecution, nothing he said corresponded to a state of passion. 
During this story, the criminal tried to demonstrate remorse and even cried. But after the interview, all this looked unconvincing. On February 1st, 2002, the victim's family was waiting for the final decision. After lengthy hearings, the jury retired to discuss the verdict. Augustin was found guilty of premeditated murder and sentenced to life imprisonment with the possibility of parole after 30 years behind bars. Gladys was buried in her hometown of Tamboril in the Dominican Republic. The body was sent to her homeland a week after her death. The woman was given to the earth in a wedding dress. A year after Gladys's death, a Florida resident put on a wedding dress and ran a marathon. After that, she gave an interview and stated that it was done in memory of Gladys's death, as well as in the name of the fight against domestic violence. Several communities still hold brides' marches in all states every year. Unfortunately, this does not lead to a significant reduction in the severity of the problem. After the trials, Augustin refused to speak publicly and did not give any comments to reporters. It became known that from the very beginning of his imprisonment, he turned to the gospel and began to preach among criminals. At the same time, his lawyers continued to fight for mitigation of punishment. Several appeals were rejected. Augustine is still in prison and will be eligible for parole in 2029. So, this tragic story about the murder of Gladys Ricard on the eve of her wedding by her own ex-boyfriend Augustine Garcia is a vivid example of the horrific consequences that unhealthy obsession and inability to accept a breakup can lead to. Despite his apparent kindness and selflessness, Augustine turned out to be a cruel criminal who cold-bloodedly took the life of his son's mother in front of her relatives. This story also demonstrates how important it is to respond in a timely manner to alarming signals in a partner's behavior, such as obsessive stalking and aggression, and not be afraid to seek help. Unfortunately, Gladys became a victim not only of her killer, but also of society's indifference to the problem of domestic violence. Although justice prevailed in this case and Augustin was sentenced to life imprisonment, this tragedy forever changed the life of Gladys's family and left an incurable wound in the hearts of her loved ones. Their story is a reminder that love and obsession are not the same thing and that no romantic feelings can justify violence and taking a person's life. If you are interested in this story and want to learn more about real criminal cases and investigations, I invite you to subscribe to the Detective Brooks channel. Here, you will find many other fascinating and instructive stories that will make you think about human nature and the dark side of life.